Like we don't have to change the world. We just have to change ourselves. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Mind Matters program. So I went to my hair cutter yesterday and sat down in the chair, reminding her of the types of ways I'd like her to cut my hair that I think, you know, reduce the male pattern baldness look of my head, which is kind of unavoidable. In any case, we we're making small talk about the weather as we sometimes do, and commented on the wind and, and the strong amounts of wind that we were experiencing earlier in the day and that we're still experiencing. And uh, I started speculating because of all the hurricanes that we had seen in uh, various places and whether or not we were feeling the uh, tailwinds of it or, or something of that sort. And my hair cutter turned to me and she said, no, it's COVID. And uh, <laughs> I thought that was really funny. <laughs> and I thought it was really insightful because she was obviously making a joke about the outsized importance that COVID has been given to our day-to-day -day lives and just showed an incredible amount of common sense and humor in dealing with what has been a rather uncomfortable situation, especially when one realizes how big the lies are concerning that one subject. Which sort of brings us to the larger theme of today's show, which is all of the lies and chaos that stem from all of the lies that we're being told, that we're confronted with every day, that we're asked to look at and have to make a conscious decision about every day, whether or not we're going to walk into an institution with our mask on or wait and see whether or not the culture of that institution, whether it be a supermarket or a bank or a hair cutter, has decided that you are a, an evil person for not wearing it. These are all obvious questions that we've kind of been dealing with uh, on a personal and on a, a much larger level for the past several months. But as we continue to follow news of various developments, uh, we're going to be confronted with even more questions that we have to consciously uh, think about and consider and, and make decisions on. And a sense of humor, like my hair cutter uh, demonstrated, is very helpful in dealing with a lot of this chaos. But also... Naming things for what they are is also a kind of uh, amelioration, a way to mitigate the, uh, the uncertainty, the, uh, the labyrinth of the unknown, the, the decisions, the various uh, places that society and politics and culture are all hurtling towards at high speed. And so... On that note, uh, I wanted to read a little bit from Jordan Peterson's uh, Maps of Meaning, which we had discussed in some depth about a year ago. So we'll be revisiting his work a little bit in, uh, in Navigating the Chaos. And this is from a chapter called The Hostile Brothers. And... He begins the chapter or section with a chapter called Archetypes of Response to the Unknown. And he says, The contamination of anomaly with the threat of death attendant on the development of self-consciousness amplifies the valence of the unknown to a virtually unbearable point. This unbearable amplification has motivated the development of two transpersonal patterns of behavior and schemas of representation. 
constituting the trans the individual as such embodied in mythology as the quote hostile brothers one of these quote hostile brothers or quote eternal sons of god is the mythological hero he faces the unknown with the presumption of its benevolence with the unprovable attitude that confrontation with the unknown will bring renewal and redemption he enters voluntarily into creative quote union with the great mother builds or regenerates society and brings peace to a warring world the other quote son of god is the eternal adversary this quote spirit of unbridled rationality horrified by his limited apprehension of the conditions of existence shrinks from contact with everything he does not understand this shrinking weakens his personality no longer nourished by the quote water of life and makes him rigid and authoritarian as he clings desperately to the familiar quote rational and stable every deceitful retreat increases his fear every new quote protective law increases his frustration boredom and contempt for life his weakness in combination with his neurotic suffering engenders resentment and hatred for existence itself the personality of this adversary comes in two forms so to speak although these two forms are inseparably inseparably linked the fascist sacrifices his soul which would enable him to confront change on his own to the group which promises to protect him and everything unknown the decadent by contrast refuses to join the social world and clings rigidly to his own ideas merely because he is too undisciplined to serve as an apprentice the fascist wants to crush everything different and then everything the decadent immolates himself and builds the fascist from his ashes the bloody excesses of the 20th century manifest most evidently in the culture of the concentration camp stand as testimony to the desires of the adversary and as monument to his power the pitfalls of fascism and decadence may be avoided through identification with the hero the true individual the hero organizes the demands of social being and the responsibilities of his own soul into a coherent hierarchically arranged unit he stands on the border between order and chaos and serves the group as creator and agent of renewal the hero's voluntary contact with the unknown transforms it into something benevolent into the eternal source in fact of strength and ability development of such strength attendant upon faith in the conditions of experience enables him to stand outside the group when necessary and to use it as a tool rather than as armor the hero rejects identification with the group as the ideal of life preferring to follow the dictates of his conscience and his heart his identification with meaning and his refusal to sacrifice meaning for security renders existence acceptable despite its tragedy so what peterson peterson's saying quite a lot here actually and uh we could take a little time to parse this out and and unpack it but i think what he's getting at mainly is that when we decide for ourselves every day what we're going to do based on what we know what we've decided is real and truthful we're empowering ourselves and perhaps aligning ourselves to this hero archetype this uh, conscientious individuated uh, person who is thinking of not only himself but of others and is able to differentiate the kind of uh, group think that so many would latch on to to feel safe and secure and would allow themselves to 
not challenge in any way what the prevailing wisdom is of a lot of what we're hearing. So I thought I'd start off there. If either of you have any comments about it, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Well, like you said, he, he's saying a lot um, in there, and it's really poignant, like you were saying, because of all of the, all the, dif the different developments on different fronts, um, politically, socially, interpersonally, and trying to figure out what is the best, what's the best way to navigate that. Because it, it's, it's so much, it seems like it's intended to throw us off our game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so if that's kind of what they're aiming for, um, or if someone's aiming for, is to throw us off kilter um, and unable to accurately respond to the different stimulus stimuli, um, then that's definitely something that we need to take into account and uh, work around. Um, and so what is one thing that uh, I was thinking about last night um, after having a phone call with some family members and having our Thanksgiving canceled because the COVID, um, I was, I was furious. I was really angry because this is absolutely silly and, and ludicrous, but nevertheless, this is what people believe. And, you know, I, I can't just force people to change because it's, you know, they have a, a right to their own opinion. But I was trying to figure out like what, what's the proper perspective because it's, it seems like uh, emotions are tied with thoughts and thoughts are shaped by our perceptions. And so I was trying to get an idea of what a, pers a good perspective on the situation would be. And I was reminded of something that Andrew Kirby, I think is his name. He does a lot of uh, stoic philosophy stuff on YouTube. And he was talking about one particular exercise that had um, uh, what people would do basically is uh, you imagine yourself, you imagine seeing yourself, you know, from above the room, like, you know, we're in this room right now. And so you imagine seeing yourself and looking down on you in the room and then you zoom out a little bit and then you see, you know, you're looking down on you and the house or the building that you're in. And then you zoom out a little bit more and you see kind of the, like the county that you're in, and then you zoom out more and you see the state you're in, and then you zoom out more and you see the country and then zoom out more. And the idea was to give you a perspective of just how like insignificant you are, but you're still part of everything. And so it's basically taking you out of whatever is going on in your life personally um, to realize that that is not the entirety of the world. Like even if, you know, your personal experience is a hellish hole, that doesn't mean that the world is bad or terrible, if that makes sense. And I think that's kind of what uh, Jordan Peterson was getting at with taking it as a given that uh, the universe isn't, or that the universe is a safe place, in a sense. Um, like, yes, there's suffering and there's pain, um, but it's not intentionally crushing. Like, it's, I guess, just a, a different perspective on, um, yeah, I don't know if that's making any sense. <laughs> well, but how did that uh, maybe relate that back to the conversation you had? So it's like, uh, so what's what was the kind of, was that the conclusion you came to for how to look at, uh, like, how to how to approach the situation? Because that's kind of what you were wondering, right? With uh... Yeah, so going back to, like, the, the conversation that I was having uh, with family, I did this mental exercise. And I realized that it wasn't just all about me. 
there was a whole, all these different things going on in the world and I'm just, you know, a tiny, small fraction of it. And so it broke the, the kind of trance, I guess you could say, that I had focusing only on myself. Uh, it broke that to where I could see a wider picture of uh, what was going on. And for some reason that just had a, an immediately calming effect. Um, just getting out of my own head and not focusing on myself, but seeing, you know, the wider context of uh, what's going on in the world and, and just, mm. you know. Yeah. So for for me, it, uh, yeah, I go through something similar because, and I guess it's a, it's a recurring problem because the more you see that there's something um, like, in some sense, fundamentally wrong about, something that's going on in the world, whether it's a, a belief that is wi widely held that is either demonstrably or probably false, it's very frustrating because then you want kind of you want everyone to just get in the get with the program, right? And and figure it out. And so this whole uh you know, it it which shall not be named is um is a crazy situation because it's like a, it's almost like some kind of mind virus has taken over the planet. Um, or no, mind something <laughs> has taken over the planet. And uh, and most people have, well, completely lose their ability to think. But then I, then you, well, you kind of have to realize, well, maybe everyone didn't have the ability to think in the first place. And, uh, and how, because it's very, it's very easy to, it's very easy to believe nonsense. Like we were talking in the was it last show or the week before that about uh, you know, pretty much belief formation and how there's not really much critical thought that goes into it. And this is actually the problem that led Peterson to write his book Maps on Maps of Meaning is how can like uh, in his in for in his examples the, the things motivating him how can something like the the ideologies of of the, the West versus communism in the 20th century, how can that lead to such a, such a conflict and one with such potentially huge consequences like the extinction of the human race? Like how can that happen? How can people go so mad? And that's what inspired a lot of Gurdjieff's writings too. If you read Beelzebub's tales, it was, and, and in search of the miraculous is how do people lose their minds to the point where they'll just rip each other apart in the streets it seems like utter madness because it is, but yet there's something about humanity that allows that to happen. And the, the kind of disheartening realization, which may actually bring some relief, like in, in your case is that, well, that's just the way things are. And sometimes like if you're, if you're in the middle of it, there's actually nothing you can do about it. The, the best thing to do in a, like, let's say a revolutionary scenario, like Gurdjieff went through in Russia is to just get the hell out of there, um, very strategically. You, you let, like, you you pretty much have to just let people go mad because you're not going to be able to calm down a mob, let alone millions of people. I mean, there are probably there are probably individuals with enough public clout who can have some minor influence, but once once that kind of mind virus takes over there's nothing that can stand in its way it's like a you know it's like a, a meteor that's on a collision course with earth once once it gets to a certain you know distance and you and you know it's coming if you if you don't have like well we don't you know earth doesn't have any planetary defense system right so once we know it's coming that's it you know there's nothing you can do to to actually stop it and that's pretty much what these um, these mass beliefs are like there's nothing there's nothing you can do as much as you might want to as much as it and no matter how frustrating it is it's still it's um there's nothing you can actually do about it you might be able to reinforce the beliefs of the people that already agree with you maybe you can well you can you might actually be able to the thing you can do is you can probably um shift you know one of those swing states in <laughs> in public opinion because there'll be there'll be the the percentage of people which is a large percent that will never change their mind no matter what and, and on both sides of an issue right there once 
something like this happens, you uh, oftentimes opposing camps will form, and there will be a a stronghold of belief that nothing will change their minds either way. And so you see that with uh, that which shall not be named, where um, the one group, nothing's ever going to change their mind. That the people that believe this is this thing is as, as bad as it says. And then there's the the, the skeptics. And there's a group of skeptics too who won't, of course, won't change their mind about anything, even if there is a a bit of evidence from the other side that suggests um, one aspect of their, even just one aspect of their um, assessment of the of the situation is off. There's a, that percentage of of that camp that will just Im- immediately dismiss it because they've already made up their minds too. But uh, and so that will apply on both. One side may actually be, on the whole, more correct than the other, but that doesn't really matter when it comes down to looking at human beliefs because confirmation bias comes into play. You have that belief formation system which then solidifies and doesn't allow for contradictory information to, to come in and to actually question some of the either the root assumptions or just the secondary or tertiary um, like um, aspects that aren't as important maybe as fundamental um, some of the fundamental positions. But still, you get these rigid beliefs, and then in the middle of those two groups, you'll have you know, the swing voters, the people who may be able to be convinced one way or the other, the ones on the fence. So there's always the, there's always the possibility of getting some people on the fence, but it's never going to be as many as you'd hope, right? You're never going to convert everyone on either side of the spectrum that, that, um, that, you're, that you're correct, right? <laughs> and uh <coughs> or even not necessarily that they or that you're correct but that they're wrong yeah <laughs> they're wrong yeah yeah it's a it's a losing it's a losing battle it's um yeah it's never it's, it's never going to happen and um because it's probably not going to happen with you either right just just think about cuz like let's say you're right right that you know the truth and now, when if you're in that position, you know the truth, right? So what will it take anyone to convince you that, that you're wrong? It's like, well, how can I be wrong? I already know what's going on. It's like any evidence that you're going to show me is only going to be um, misleading or I- interpreted poorly. Um, so I already know what's right. So why, how, would I, how would you ever change my mind? Well, that's exactly what the people on the other side are thinking too. There's... It, um, logic and reason is never going to be enough to to move that many people to to change that many minds. So, but on so there's that, and kind of realizing that on the one hand, it's like I said, it's kind of uh, disheartening. On the other, it can take a load off your back. That uh, well, I guess I don't have to try to engage in this impossible journey of convincing everyone that they're wrong. Um, Maybe you know, just pick off a few of the of the the ones in the middle that will that will uh, that will come around that will be able to listen to to reason, but also still to there there should be an element of humility in that too to to realize okay, as certain as I am in my position, the, the other the people I disagree with are just as certain of their position. So so maybe so so what really is the difference? Um. There may be a difference in terms of well, one person may actually be right, but on a, on an emotional level, which is where beliefs are really formed, they're kind of equal. It's like you're you're a, an arrogant son of a bitch, and you're an arrogant son of a bitch, and you both think you're right. So so what do you do in that situation? Well, you might realize um, it's very easy to say, well, that guy's an arrogant son of a bitch because he won't listen to reason, right? And then say, oh, well, maybe I'm a bit of an arrogant son of a bitch too. So um, so I'll just I'll I'll hold my beliefs a little less tightly, you know. I'll uh, I'll be willing to to question them. I can still be conv- convinced, you know. I still have a position. I might still think because of that that it's it's important, but just be a little less of an asshole about it. Is uh, yeah, is my advice. <laughs> well, at least for for me, uh, after talking with them uh, a bit about it, I mean, I understand completely like why they're doing the things that they're doing, like why they canceled Thanksgiving. I completely understand their position given their uh, stance on things. It's, it's an overabundance of caution. Um, 
I guess, would be the the way that they are looking at it. As well, we don't really know a whole lot about this, and and this is you know kind of hard to look into. So out of an overabundance of caution, we're just going to say no. So I, I can't fault them for that. And I'm, I'm not, you know, upset at them for that. What I'm really upset about is, you know, all the, the media uh, yeah. driving up fear intentionally. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which, again, you know, is not something that I have any control over. Um, and that's just what they do. I mean, that's, was it Gurdjieff that said, like, don't get mad at the weather? Or was that somebody else? Who was that? It could, it have, could been. have been. Yeah. <laughs> could have been. Might have been one of the Stoics. I, I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember who it was, but it's like you don't get mad at the weather for being the weather. It's it's just a thing that is. And so it's like, should I really be mad at the media for being a propaganda arm as it has always been? Yeah. And it's and people just aren't uh, aren't seeing it for as blatant. Uh, propaganda as it really is. Well, how about this? How about we rant a little bit as we, as is normal when we're frustrated about a particular lie that gets eaten up by people we care about and, and very much want to understand those things that we think we understand to be the truth. Uh, and strengthen our own help help it to fuel our own resolve in terms of as much as possible anyway modeling our own beliefs and understanding so that there is no identification with those who disagree with those who believe the adversary as peterson would put it and let things be what they are and let things, uh, what's the expression? Um, let the chips fall where they may. So that if there, if there is a possibility, for instance, like you were saying earlier about the, the swing states, if there are swing people, people who aren't really so sure of where they stand on it because the messaging has been so strong and conflicting on either side, that being that strong model, this ideal of ourselves that we are aspiring to with the, uh, with the faith that there is a benevolence in the universe, even if we don't see it necessarily, but that we are acting as if it exists, that, that fortifying our own strength in that direction without the expectation or without the hope that that would sway minds is one way we can go about this. You know, if, if, if people are able to understand it because of my own behavior and actions and judiciousness and knowledge, uh, wonderful. If that doesn't happen, it's to be expected anyway. It's kind of a, uh, it is a kind of stoic approach to all of this at a time when our emotions are running very high about certain things and we feel a little bit push and pulled in certain directions and, and even asking ourselves, am I, am I falling into a little bit of confluence about the election, about this impending second lockdown, about the, the, the great reset and all of the what that portends, you know, and, and all the ideological madness that we're seeing on the streets, for instance, all of these things are, are rousing emotions are, um, are pushing and pulling us and acting on our, whatever triggers or buttons that, that exist in us that, uh, like you were saying earlier, you know, it, it threatens to throw us off kilter and that's, that's not what we want. Uh, or in any case, if that does happen from time to time, we, we'd like to find a, uh, an equilibrium, a way to reach equilibrium or homeostasis such that we're, uh, we're still functioning. We're still proactive. We're still, uh, not so overwhelmed by these things that we're, um, 
that were lashing out or uh, doing things that would only further cause other people to react to us, you know, leaving us open uh, and extra vulnerable to some form of attack. So um, I don't think there are many answers in what I just said, but I, I do think that in that is a way to frame um, some of the ways that we want to go ahead in, in dealing with a lot of what we're seeing and experiencing. Mm -hmm. The, there's a tendency like we're, we've been talking about to, to want people to want people to be like you, right. To want to form them into your image. And I think the solution to that is like you're saying to, first of all, not kind of anticipate an outcome you know, not expect things to go one way or the other. And in the case of an ideal like truth, which is perhaps the highest ideal and the most important, the way to kind of um, like do service to that ideal or to, to, um, to live up to it would be to state the truth um, without the, just state the truth for the sake of stating the truth. You know, whether anyone hears you or not, that's like the, it's the prophet's curse, right? To, to speak the truth and to have no one listen to you. But it needs to be done. And there will always be probably at least one person who's listening. And maybe that's all it takes. But so prior, you know, just a few minutes ago, I was talking about kind of uh, toning down the, the, the self-importance with coming with thinking that you already know the truth. But on the other hand, there is, like, if you if you actually think you do know the truth, you do have, an, like, an obligation, I think, to, to either to live it or to share it in some way, but not in a way that kind of violates anyone else's um, free will, essentially. And that's what I think you were getting at when you first brought up the, the story of the phone call you were having, Adam. So... And that's that's where I think that there is a space for calling other people out, is because on either side, like you will have people that kind of go too far, people that um, that want to control other people's lives to to actually essentially change what they believe forcefully and will change their beliefs, actions, and feelings. It's kind of the it's the it's one of the the sickest things that people can do to each other of course there are many sick things that people can do to each other but one of them is is this this tendency to totally control a person to enslave them you know body mind and spirit or emotion you see this th these are all the things that we are horrified by when we look at even just the history of the 20th century we look at like the uh, the enslavement of physical bodies of people's actual persons, um, and then the the kind of the the mind control and the and the the brainwashing and the programming, which was kind of it's it's just it's a cliche nowadays. But looking at what what the the kind of indoctrination that you saw the, the over the top indoctrination that you saw in communist countries, of course, non communist countries have their own types of indoctrination too, um, and then. Even on an on a on the same level, and you can see this even in interpersonal relationships. It's, it's to to want to to shape the way a person feels about something, to shape essentially to shape their values, um, what they think is important, and it's the it's that totalitarian impulse that I don't actually think most people have it. I think that a lot of people do have it, but that. When a, when a phenomenon like this goes on, you only ever see the most extreme people, so then it's easy to kind of to think that everyone else wants it. I actually, I have no idea what the percentage would actually be. That would, I'd be interested in finding that out to see when it comes down to it, like in the, in the thick of a crisis, how many people actually want this kind of control over other people? And like on a real level, not, not necessarily even, that, not necessarily something that can just be gleaned from like a simple poll asking, oh, well, sh you know, should the government do X to, to do Y and, and inst institute some kind of, uh, you know, policy or whatever? Because even that, a person could, could think like, well, yeah, I think they should. But when it comes down to it, they might not actually 
want something like that. They they may it may there are all kinds of circumstances for why a person can answer something on a on a poll yeah. like that. But you can't extrapolate out. Yeah. So I'm wondering how many people there are who are actually like tyrants like that. I'd be I'd be interested to to figure that out. But so but that's what it comes down to for me is like on our, one of our previous shows there were some comments um on uh, I think it was it was the question about like communism essentially and um essentially saying well we've we've quoted um you know some process philosophers like David Gray Griffin and mentioned John Cobb though I've never read any of John Cobb's stuff and so the 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 listener was asking what we thought of of that you know the fact that we're so anti-communist and that you know this philosopher who we whose philosophy we like seem to be have a a pro marxist view of things and uh, like how we kind of reconcile that and my point was that well i don't i don't have any problem with communists as long as they like keep it to themselves it's when you try to um coerce other people into either thinking what you think or forcing them to live under under a system that you think is ideal that's when that's when the line is crossed for me so i have no problem with people believing anything as long as they keep it to themselves when it comes to actually um, exerting some kind of actual control over someone's life so you know if you think if you think that communism is the best type of system you know i have no problem with that if you then form a you know a revolutionary group and militias all over the country and then actively t- try to take over the government to then institute you know a system of rules that I will then have to live under. Um, that's that's that, like that's what I said. That's where I draw the line. It's like as long as you just believe it, that's fine. I, cause, because there's a reciprocity there. Like I'm not. I have certain um, convictions about, you know, what certain ideal social interactions and and uh, frameworks and systems might be. But I have no interest in forcibly. For, in enforcing some other person who disagrees with me to live under my system mm-hmm. and uh, for me to have that kind of power over them. So I think there's a, there is a moral dimension to, to, um, to these kinds of conflicts where I guess um, without getting into the kind of ideological baggage attached to the terms, there is a kind of like a, an authoritarian um, versus libertarian like um, conflict going on where it's like, and and you can find this in, you can find those two dynamics in any in any grouping, basically. So you can you can find authoritarian people even in a in what might be a, a libertarian position on things, and vice versa. But overall, there is a there is an authoritarian streak that is kind of running rampant, and that is being um, facilitated by pretty much everyone publicly, like. If you look at media and governments, they're all going with this, you know, as hard as they can. And the the libertarian, the 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 one that says, "Well, just leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone," is like the are the ones that are um, totally demonized. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's well, because sad. you can think of it in like a like a vaccine, right? You know, you have the uh, authoritarians would say we need to vaccinate everyone and then you have a more libertarian person who would say like you know let me make my own choice but the authoritarians are like no we have to get it for everyone whereas the libertarian position would be like well if it works then what does it matter if i get it or not because you will be safe yeah, and if it works i might get it you know <laughs> that's yeah. the thing is that uh, taking a libertarian position doesn't necessarily mean that you're a uh, um like what's the word just a uh, that you contrarian contrarian and you just reject everything for the sake that of rejecting it of, of course it might mean that but but that's the thing is that authoritarians want to just there's something about contrarians like the actual contrarians that just irks them so much it's like no it's like you must conform <laughs> and uh how, how can someone not do what i think is best for them um when well i yeah. You know, this reminds me of uh, an article I had just read by Gilad Atzman, where he talks about the the dream that the left has, the dream that the cultural Marxists and the revolutionaries in the West have. 
and their their dream uh, is based on staying asleep to reality, from being untethered to reality. And I mean, there are lots of, I think, unwitting comparisons to, uh, or inferences you can draw from the works of uh, Gurdjieff on the subject of of sleep and consciousness and consci and conscience. But his main point was that there is a a whole uh, population, a whole percentage of people who are too busy working, trying to make a living, who are effectively engaged with what is in the world, instead of dreaming about a world that would conform to their, their expectations and their desires uh, for, for self-fulfillment. That there's a, a tendency and a big distinction between uh, the revolutionaries, the dreaming left, and the more centrist or conservative individuals who, uh, who would rather not waste their time reimagining utopia at the expense of what they can be doing with themselves, with what is right now. And that doesn't mean that they don't have a tendency towards innovation or making things better. Uh, but it does mean starting with what they think is the reality of things. And we've talked about it many times. One of Gurdjieff's main, main points was that humanity is in a state of sleep, uh, which, which is exactly what permits them to go off on these uh, detrimental uh, flights of fancy and and imagine things the, the way that they the way that they hope things would be uh so it's you know it, it's really something that uh that we i think can ask ourselves how how much are we engaged with what is uh how much are we you know working towards making things better on a on even a very basic level and who are those people who are actually out there trying to affect the the lives and the minds of of others uh through coercion through violence through their dream of utopia through their vision of uh all the policies that would make things better for the whole world in, in, in a perfectly egalitarian uh perfectly uh uh beautiful earth, you know, vision of the world. And, you know, we do well to remind ourselves that these, these visions have never worked. They've never been successful. They've only ever caused, uh, on a much lar larger level, uh, unpleasantness and suffering and, and even death on a very large scale. And so, uh, the personal becomes political and um and we're we're being uh we're being asked right now in a very real way to uh think about what it is we think we understand about what's happening because we've i mean especially of late you know you 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 read um who was shock doctrine author naomi klein naomi klein comes out with a book you know, someone who is able to explain financial and economic terrorism as the West employs it, you know, uh, getting nations in debt and uh, basically, you know, the IMF and the World Trade Organization going in and, and basically raping a, a country of its resources and of its life's blood. She, she got that right under her belt. But then 15 years later, she has bought into it seems you know the whole green new deal the whole uh the whole kind of this whole new vision of uh socialist uh thinking that would seek to it, it's the ultimate shock doctrine actually and um and so there there are a lot of people with who were 
who've done a lot of great work who seem to be, you know, falling by the wayside. So I say this as, as way of an example that we are, we have to be on our toes basically because, um, you know, 15 years ago we were, we were frightened of the, of the far right with the Bush junior administration. And now we wake up and there's this whole other, even more, uh, audacious in your face, obvious, uh, movement from the far left that, that I think very few could have anticipated except perhaps for Jordan Peterson, who had looked at the, at this situation in some depth. Um, so a time to be on our toes for sure. And, and to look at every particular issue for its truthfulness or not. Well, that, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, weren't we talking about alternative media personalities and Naomi Klein's kind of one like, and, and how, uh, a lot of the guys that were kind of spot on 20 years ago are kind of missing the mark these days. Well, in a lot of cases, and I pointed out, like I think I used Michael Parenti as an example, and there are others, but there, there's enough hints that, that when you when you go back and look at the, the ideological underpinnings of, of a lot of these people, you could pretty much predict what was going on. And like with Naomi Klein, it doesn't really surprise me because, well, before I get into Naomi Klein, basically... Um, no matter what your position on anything, you can be right on a on a certain number of topics. It doesn't you know it doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on whether you're right about a whole bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. So you can have a totally like totally weird perspective, like overall perspective on something, and then get zero in on something and get it like almost a hundred percent correct. I mean that's pretty much what most people are like. You know they might have something that they really understand, and then everything else they're just a complete wreck. Um, with Nao with Naomi Klein. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in that book, you know, I haven't read the whole book. I've read parts of it, but as far as I can tell from the people I know who have read it, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But her one of the one, the the whole idea of the shock doctrine, like the the quote, was the she she framed that entire book on a complete misunderstanding. I think she actually was confused about which Friedman she didn't like. Because uh, she was like the, the the premise of the book was Milton Friedman and this shock doctrine and the, and this quote of his about uh, about shocking you know nations you know ec economically and she talks about how Milton Friedman is this neoconservative and and uh, you know wants wars and all this stuff. I'm pretty sure she was confusing him with like I don't with it Thomas Friedman. There's a neocon New York you know, Times New Thomas York Times Friedman. guy like Thomas Friedman. I think she just confused them because Milton Friedman was an anti-war um, libertarian who who didn't have any of the beliefs that she ascribed to him. Mm -hmm. And even the quote that she had about like shock doctrine, I can't remember it off the, off the top of my head, but it was co completely taken out of context. He was actually, actually saying the exact opposite of what she wanted him to say. And so she frames the entire book around this totally false premise. And then as far as I can tell, has some interesting stuff to say in the middle that's, that's correct, but just completely completely absolutely misrepresents like Milton Friedman's views which are essentially the premise for her entire book mm -hmm. so um, there's so just to reiterate your point to, to look at everything carefully there um, there's of course a lot of in this specific case a lot of like just economic terrorism that goes on but when you read someone or or hear someone saying something you can't you can't take everything they say um, on board, you like you have to you have to check check things out and make sure they're actually getting all their facts straight. And um, unfortunately, that takes a little bit of of thinking. Like um, uh, even just well, I don't know. I don't think I'll. I don't think it's necessary to really get in, get into examples. But even in um, like depend depending on what side you take on the uh, on the the current election fiasco you'll be able to find like just uh you'll be able to find wrong things on both sides you know there's very fine arguments on both sides but uh but there are some some bad arguments on both on on both sides too um and just to be just to, to realize that that's realize that that's going to happen and again to try not to be so entrenched in in one side so that you um so that you latch on to what might be well, so that you don't believe a lie, essentially, because there there are there are some lies or 
less, you know, a less charged word. There are some just incorrect things going around on both sides. Again, there might be a an abundance of wrongness on <laughs> on one side as opposed to the other, but uh, you got to approach everything with with a, a critical mind, in my view. And um, well, I think yeah. I think that's a good point, and I think that even recognizing the weaknesses or fallacies in in what one's one would be normally leaning towards as a position actually makes you stronger mm -hmm. because if if you're able to qualify your point of view and say yeah you know i agree that that isn't really that doesn't bolster my position at all but i tell you what does yeah then you can put your conviction your energy your focus on on stressing what does on on putting into perspective those things that that are correct and i think that gives your position and who you are especially if you're going to take the time and energy to be vocal about it or to share information it you have greater integrity with those that you're communicating with and you're also there's greater integrity within your own being within your own uh, mind within your own heart uh, when you when you put yourself in the force of your being even if it's just a little bit mm -hmm. uh, behind a certain position and being honest with it um, like you were saying about what is a strong point and what is a weakness like you can have a particular position on something and realize that uh, mm -hmm. my position is really strong in this set of circumstances and it's pretty weak over on this other side and it it's kind of similar to a person's personality like you can have really strong personality traits that are really good and beneficial and then you can have some weaker personality traits that you know aren't really very good um, and you don't want to be uh, playing up your weaknesses while and focusing on your weaknesses and trying to use that as a strength when it's really a weak point yeah. mm -hmm. um, like if you were building a house you don't want to build it on quicksand you know you want to build it on bedrock um because that's what's actually going to support you and so it's it's kind of the same way that if you actually look at a specific situation and really look for yourself and when you find it for yourself like then you know it's it's become part of your being um because you you've actually looked at it and parsed through it so you you're not relying on any other person's position. You you know why this works the way it works and why this is a good and solid position and why uh, this is a weak point. Like all of this is now a part of you and so you can navigate a specific situation uh, with a lot more creative nuance. Uh, you have that ability because this is a part of a part of you now and that's, it's not something that you're relying on someone else to tell you uh, what is or is not correct or the best way of going about doing things. And to kind of bring it back a little bit to um, how best to navigate the situation moving forward as individuals, um, we have to work within our sphere of influence. Like we, you and I, like the three of us, we, we're not Donald Trump. Like we can't just, you know, change the opinion of millions of people with a tweet. We don't have that capability. But uh, we can, to one extent or another, influence our family. And we, you know, again, we're not Donald Trump, so we can't change the structure of things. But we can recognize them. We can see what's coming down the pike, and we can see how things are going to, you know, possibly shape out. And we can realize uh, or see opportunities where we know people are going to need help. Mm-hmm. And we can take that as our position. Like we don't have to change the world. We just have to change ourselves. And so in that way we can actually help people and be a force for good as opposed to just wrecking everything because we think we know everything. When we, we, uh, we should know by now that we don't. Um, and to think otherwise is some self-important arrogance on a unbelievable level. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that uh, that would be a good place to end it, Adam. Uh, those thoughts serve us well if we follow them. 
Um, and we thank our listeners for tuning in, for commenting on the SOT page on YouTube. Uh, we also appreciate uh, liking the videos and subscribing. And uh, we hope you tune in again. Take care, everyone, and thank you.